It's my delight uh, at the moment to uh, welcome uh, Margaret Moore from uh, Queen's uh, to come and uh, share with us uh, a kind of a talk that is really based upon uh, a manuscript that is pretty well there and in place that she's been working on for a couple of years. Margaret has been at Queen's for a, a 11 years and had the august title of the uh, Edward Peacock. Peacock Professor of Political Theory, which I find extremely intriguing. Uh, and we won't, uh, won't go into that. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was at the University of Waterloo and before that at uh, York University, which is where uh, I met her many, many years ago while doing my PhD. Uh, she was educated uh, in Canada and did her doctorate at the LSE uh, and is here today to give us a talk entitled The Political Towards a Political Theory of Territory. So she'll speak for 30 or 40 minutes and then we will grill her uh, remorselessly in uh, the Carlton spirit of these experiences. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a delight to have, be invited. Uh, um, okay, so, um, so what I was going to do, so I'll talk a little bit about what motivates my interest in territory. So first of all, there's a kind of personal interest because before I started working on this manuscript, I wrote, I, I, I worked on a lot of different discrete things and I worked on secession and I was interested in nationalism, but I didn't really, but you know, then people would write about secession and apply kind of liberal democratic principles like freedom of association to them. And I was always, and I, I did that because I didn't have a theory about territory, but it was apparent to me that it wasn't the same as like a chess club, it wasn't an association of that kind, and that the territorial element was under-theorized. So, so part of it's a kind of personal issue that it's been lurking in my work for a long time, and I used to have some kind of a bracketing end note as if, uh, you know, as if I, it's a problem I should solve, and then eventually you think, well, actually, you should think you should turn your attention to it. But the second reason why I, I talk about the political theory of territory is because, I mean, territory is one of the most under-theorized issues, right? Or under-theorized concepts. So we have a world which is entirely divided into territorial states. There's every usable piece of earth that belongs to a territorial state. And the process and the process isn't complete because now the territory so even though people talk about globalization and deterritorialization i'm not going to deny any of that we still have the whole world divided up into t territorial states and the process isn't complete because now they're extending the territorial dimension under the oceans right they're making claims underneath the oceans and um to the frozen arctic under the seabed so i think I, and we have hardly any theory about what this is, about about what territory is, about the, what, how we think about territory, what possibly could justify it. And a lot of the issues, like territorial disputes, are at the center of some of the most intractable con conflicts, too. So secession is conflicts, conflicts over stolen land, there's unoccupied islands, which are claimed by more than one state. We have frozen you know, territory under the sea, and we have no principle to deal with that, actually and not even agreement on what we, how we should think about territory. So it seems to me that, that, that it's worth thinking about. Right? And, um, and, and in international relations and political science generally, it's under-theorized as well. So international, a lot of people in, in, that talk about international relation, relations talk about sovereignty and assume there's a territorial dimension. And in fact, in international law in the 1933 Montevidian Convention, they define the state as a territorial entity. So it is an, uh, de, uh, it's a kind of definitional of what it is to be a state, to be an entity with fixed territories and permanent population under government control and with the capacity to enter into relations with other states. So it's defined as what a state is. It has a fixed territory. But no account of how we should think about it, how that domain should be defined, or, um, or, or how particular groups get particular territory, which is a kind of really interesting question. I call that the attachment problem. So, and in political theory, it's a problem too, which is my discipline, because almost all accounts of normative accounts of the state are interested in the relationship between the state and citizens. You know, the rights that citizens have and the duties that states have and what would be just, but not, but, but abstract from the problem 
that the state has a f geographical domain, the, a territory, and it, that it almost doesn't even enter the, the picture. It's as if once you have the right relationship between the state and the citizens, the territory just falls into place, which is what I'm going to talk about, right? That's actually a really dominant kind of, I'm going to call that the Kantian account. So it's a statist account. So, and, and so political theorists, and if you can think about Rawls as a particular example, doesn't even mention the fact that it's a territorial entity and really is just really interested in, right. in the issue of justice between the state and the citizen. Okay, so in the dis so that's 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 the motivation. That's not hard to motivate this talk. Now the question is, do you have a real answer to it, right? Because there's not that many answers, or not not much less written than you would, than I would like. So in the when you think about territory, really almost everybody who who kind of has focused on it, it looks like there's three different elements in the picture. It's like a triangular relationship between three elements. So I want to say that all the theories of territory, the extant theories of territory, have three elements in it. And the elements are, if we're going to talk, think about territory, it's the state, the people, and land. And it's a triangular relationship between those three elements. And depending on how you place them in, in what, what you think the relationships are, you get different theories of territory. But I think they all have all three of those in the picture. Okay. Um, so the different ways of conceiving of that relationship results in different theories. And then uh, as a kind of preliminary, this is, I'm still on preliminary parts, I want to say that there's different ways in which we could conceive of territory. So there's, and you can think about this in terms of how we think about property and territory. So there's a dominant tradition that thinks of territory as just like property. So you can think of Locke, for example. On a Lockean account, individuals have natural rights to property and they, they enter into a social contract as property owners protecting it. And so you can think of the, t and they create the territorial dimension of the state. So the territory of the state is kind of an amalgam of individual property holders and property is a foundational idea, right? And you have a collective analog of that where people think that monarchs had territory and they actually did bring it with them into merit, like through marriage, right? Like if you think about the formation of a lot of modern states, it was, you know, like for example, the United Kingdom in 1707, it was, it was the, I mean, there was actually a union, but of Scottish nobles had to vote, but in addition to that, it was connected to the fact that James the First, James the Sixth of Scotland, became James the First of England, and and and, and there were dowries too. So so that's a collective analog. Now, okay, so what I want to say about that account, the property account, is that I don't discuss it. Well, I do in I do in what, this manuscript. It's not yet a book, but. I think there's problems with the property account. I think that was a dominant account historically. Um, I think there's problems with thinking about the territory of the state as like property. And one problem, just, just to mention is, it's hard to know how people, how the citizens in a democratic society would feature in that account. So what I do is I just argue that I think it's wrong to think of it like property. Right? It might have some dimensions like property. So what I talk about territory, I'm talking about another kind of conception of territory where we think about territory as the geographical domain of the state. It's just the jurisdictional, the geographical domain in which this, it, it, of jurisdictional authority. So, and, and, and so I'm not saying it's a piece of property. I'm saying it's a, the geographical domain in which we exercise jurisdictional authority. So that's a kind of... And the question I ask, or the, 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 the people that I'm putting into play here, are all people who agree with that account. They think the property account's wrong, and they all think territory is the, the domain, the geographical domain in which, of jurisdictional authority. And the, que and the disagreement here between the people I'm just about to talk about are who holds rights over territory? Who, how, who, who do, who, what kind of... If, if, if rights over territory are held by a, hold, have a, a holder, who is the holder? And there, and there, I think, there's real disagreement. Okay, so I'm going to say it's not property. It's the, we all agree on the conception, but we disagree on who the holder of territory is. So that gets me to the paper. The structure of the paper that I'm going to talk about is I've, I've put three different theories into play. And one theory 
is a cultural nationalist theory, where they think about the cultural nation as the holder of territory. The second is the st a status theory, even a legitimate state theory, where it's legitimate states. And a third theory, which is the one that I'm trying to uh, develop, is a theory where um, it's not a status theory. It locates territorial rights in the people, and the state is the instrument by which the people act, but it doesn't define the people in cultural terms. Okay, that's the, so it's a, it's a, it's a pre-political account, but it's not a cultural account. So uh, that's the way it's structured. So, so then it's easy. It's part one, I talk about part cultural nationalism. Part two, I talk about the statist account. And part three, I talk about my own account. Okay. So I need to say something about what might be wrong with those other accounts, right? So cultural nationalists argue that cultural groups are a kind of pre-political territorial right holder. And they sort of ha justify rights to particular bits of land through cultural, historical, and identity-related arguments involving the relationship of the cultural group to the territory. And so actual real nationalists, like real activist nationalists, all just use whatever argument gives their group, the favored group, the most land. That's, that's not really worth considering. But philosophical nationalists make another kind of argument. And what they want to say is, because they, they're being very interested in focusing on the nation's right to particular territory. So I look at two nationalists, philosophical nationalists, and, they, and the argument that uh, Tam, Tamar Meisel, she's written this book called Territorial Rights, and David Miller has got this book on nationalism. And what they, want, what they claim is that, the, that, a, that a, a national group, a cultural na nation, inhabits a certain territory, right? They occupy this territory. And the, the, the culture, the cultural nation, their culture becomes mixed with physical characteristics of the land, and the physical characteristics of the land become shaped by the culture, and it becomes infused in various different ways, and they develop laws, and they have, have property rights, they engage in public works, they shape the physical appearance of the territory. And through this symbiotic relationship between the culture and the land, they then have the best right or entitlement to that land. And then they make an argument that then they have an entitlement to jurisdictional authority. So the, the nexus here, there's three parts to this cultural nationalist nexus. Part one is the claim about culture. Part two is about land, and part three is about jurisdictional authority. So the move is to describe the cultural group as connected to the land where they have entitlement first, and then to make the claim for jurisdictional authority, right? Which, like creating laws and being self-determining over that land. And um, so there's a, this three-part nexus. And I think, actually, and I want to say that making, that making the argument between the, the group and the land first is actually a really helpful move. But it's the third part of that, the exercise of jurisdictional rights, I think is a little bit weaker in that account. So uh, this is the, um, so it's a kind of, you know, they have this idea of cultural groups mixing their labor with this land, right, in some kind of way. And the argument for jurisdictional rights runs this way. I think I even write down the quote because it's a very, Explicit quote. So this is from David Miller. He says, it's not difficult to justify... So this is after he's described the group as having this symbiotic relationship with land and having architecture and public space that they've developed and worked on. And then he says, it's not difficult to justify rights of jurisdiction on the basis of what has been said. Rights of private property alone will not do the job of protecting this added cultural value because A, such rights are always susceptible to being redrawn by whoever holds rights of jurisdiction, and B, much of the embodied value that the group has created is likely to be located in public space, in public architecture, landscapes of historic significance, and so forth. The group needs to maintain overall control of the territory in order to secure that value over time, and for that it needs rights of jurisdiction, such as normally exercised by the state. So that's the claim about why they need jurisdictional authority. They have mixed their labor with the land, they've created value in it, and then they need jurisdiction to create rules that protect their value. And it's subject to a number of criticisms, and the one that I focus on is, I think it's over-inclusive. Like, so in this nexus, 
And it, I mean, it's not like Miller's wrong about, he describes this as national groups. But if the nexus is between a cultural group and land, right, that's the, the main, if there's this infusion between the two, and he wants to say cultural nations then get jurisdictional rights, why do we limit it to cultural nations, which is what he wants to do? It's an internal critique, really. So in my example, so if you think about Little Havana in Miami, you have a cultural group. It's mixing its labor with the little piece of land. And the argument looks like if you're gonna, that they should get rights of jurisdiction. And I, so I think it's got that. Now, I'm not saying, now he doesn't want to say that. So this is like an internal critique, right? He wants to describe nations as doing that. But why should we think of nations? There's a lot of different cultural groups here. Why are we focusing on nations as the one that's mixing their culture with the land? Why doesn't this happen in neighborhoods? So it kind of has an over-inclusive, I guess the criticism is it's over-inclusive, right? That even though they don't want to say that, I think that the logic of their argument leads them, it's hard for them to prevent that. that. So that's, that's my criticism. So that's um, part A. I thought I might have a structure there. I do that in lectures. I write down the structure of the lecture so I know where I am. You just have a picture here. I just have a picture, yeah, from the web. As a, when I was younger, it turns out. Okay. <laughs> so, so, um, so that's one kind of argument. And what's nice about that argument is it's a, a pre-political. It, it, it imagines the pre-political group is holding rights to territory and using the state as a mechanism. That's the structure of that argument. The second argument that I'm going to look at is a statist argument. And the statist argument has a different kind of problem, has a kind of opposite problem than the cultural nationalist argument. And here, the state is seen as the fundamental holder of territorial right. It's the, it's the, 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 the who holds territory, it's only states hold territory. And the state is seen as the necessary, um, as, as, uh, as, a, as an instrument of the people. There's different versions of a statist argument. There's a kind of Hobbesian version, but there's also, but which just if you hold, make peace and stability. But I focus on a Kantian version because it, it, it moralizes. It has a lot of better attachment. So I'll just give you an account of what the Kantian version is. So, he, so I'll just describe it for those of you who haven't read Kant recently. Just give you a really quick view. But the, in Kant's argument... So this is an argument that actually justifies the state, is what it does. So the argument, the structure of the argument is it justifies the state. And then it looks like in justifying the state, it justifies whatever the state needs. It turns out the state needs territory. Okay, and, that, and so the quick, the quick argument here is that it doesn't tell you which pieces of territory. So it has a, it's, it's, that might just be that it's not complete. But I think it also has counterintuitive pro, uh, consequences. So the Kantian argument is that People should leave the state of nature. Into, he imagines a state of nature, and he says individuals should leave a state of nature, that is, a state with no political authority and lacking in justice, and we're obligated to submit to a common jurisdictional authority. He doesn't, it's not like a Lockean account where he says we're obligated to submit to a common political authority. And the obligation is initiated in Kant by the possession of things, property, which in one w possessions, which in one way is an expression of our freedom, because as we go about, we possess things. It's an expression of our liberty. But it also contradicts other people's freedom, since removing things from common use uh, prevents other th people from enjoying the object in question. So the state of nature has a real problem about justice, right? And he says, since, my fr exer since the exercise of my freedom unavoidably involves the restricting other people's freedom, the dilemma can only be resolved by the reciprocal recognition of everyone's obligation to respect the fundamental principles around the acquisition, transfer, and use of objects in the external world, in other words, rights of property. That's the Kantian argument. So he says the reciprocal recognition involves creating a civil condition which ensures that my freedom is respected and everybody else's freedom is respected and transforms possession into property and also means that I'm not subject to external will, okay? So it's a framework of general rules and the foundation of civil society. That's how Kant's argument goes. And the achievement of this account is he describes the state. It was a fabulous argument. I just love that argument. That's why I gave you a long description of it. It describes the state as necessary for justice. And it says why you're obligated to, remi to be in a state rather than to remain um, in a state of nature. But what it describes is why the state in general is necessary. It doesn't tell you 
that particular states have authority over particular territories. You can't do that. It just sort of says if you're proximate to people, right, then you have an obligation to enter into this reciprocal recognition and create a civil order. And the other thing about the Kantian argument is that it really strongly connects the state with justice. And that, on one hand, that's a great, great argument, right? Because if the state is necessary to justice, then it really it gives you this really strong normative argument for why, why um, for, for the state, but also if the state's, if the territory is necessary for, for, for territory. But I think that, so on the one hand, it's like a great argument. But on the other hand, it's, you know, it has this very tight link between the state and justice and territory. And that link is problematic. And I'm going to just describe why I think it's problematic, because on the one hand, I'm kind of powerfully attracted to it, okay? But I reject it, so it took me a, a long time to do this. So if we, for one thing, justice is a very demanding standard. So if you think that the state is justified because it gives us justice, and the states are justified, the state's control over territory is, is connected to the, the, the fulfillment of justice, then it looks like for one thing, most states in the past were just not just, right? So it means that most countries that exercise jurisdiction over territory in the past, actually, I want to say now, but anyway, but certainly in the past, by any standard of justice, even a kind of minimal human rights, they weren't just. So their exercise of jurisdiction wasn't just. And I think, and, I'm, and so my question is, like, do we really believe this? Do we really think that France in the 17th century had no territorial rights, that Morocco in the 18th century, that principalities in India prior to British rule, they had no territorial rights? Most people think that maybe they weren't just, fully just, but they still had, they exercised rights over territory. And the reason, if I can follow my logic here, and, if you, and, the, re, and the reason why it's pressing to me is, to explore this intuition is if you think about why colonialism is wrong. Now, I think colonialism is wrong, okay? That's what I first want to say. And most people think that the wrong of colonialism is, is partly captured by the fact that the imperial authorities failed to fully include colonial peoples in their political projects. So one part of the problem, it was a, it was a system of domination and subordination. I think that's part of the wrong of colonialism. But I think that there's another reason why we think of colonialism as wrong, and it was that it involved the taking of territory. And it wasn't simply that it violated the equality condition, that it didn't equally treat people, treat people but the, it looked like the imperial powers were engaged in trying to take territorial rights from people. And if you think that's part of the wrong of colonialism, you can't think that just that that just going going into places and giving them and, and 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 entering into reciprocal relations with them gets you territorial rights. You have to think in some pre-political way that people resident on that land have some kind of right to create jurisdictional authorities themselves that colonialism is <coughs> violating. That that's that's I think the the problem with the justice argument. I don't know if how how. Um, so, and, and also, like, so it's not just the wrong, so that was, that was how I thought it was wrong. But, you can, but I'm going to argue that actually in international law, that isn't consonant with international law either, because it has counterintuitive consequences in cases of when a state has failed. And just to give you a quick example, if, if, if you get territorial rights by implementing justice, if you're not implementing justice, let's say the state has failed, does that mean that somebody else who can come in and implement justice and they get territorial rights? So if Somalia is a failed state, can the neighboring country come in and gain territorial rights by implementing justice? Can the United States come in? and So, uh, so in the cases of failed states, there's a particular problem. And even annexation is a slight, is a problem too in certain kinds of con contexts. So I want to say that the the, this great link between the state, justice, and territorial rights doesn't match our intuition in, in, in certain cases, okay? Yeah. I want to say, not that I think international law is necessarily right, but that we don't really think, I think that's a powerfully held intuition that even if you have to go, even if there's an emergency situation, it only should be intervention in an emergency to establish order or to do something, and you don't, 
and then you should leave, right? I think that's our intuition. So to, to make sense of that, you need something that's pre-political, some right held by people to create a state, rather than the states hold it. Okay. So, okay, so that, those, are, those are the two camps. One's a cultural nationalist camp. I don't want to, I don't, so I don't want to be a cultural nationalist. And I, I don't think that argument works. But I have deep concerns about this statist argument too. There's a third, pro another problem with statism is just retrospective. You have to first be a state to get territorial rights. It doesn't tell you when you have people contending who should get it. Mm -hmm. At least the nationalist can say, it can answer that question. So I think there's kind of two. <coughs> so what I try to do, how much time do I have, by the way? About 15 minutes. Okay, now I'm in real trouble. Okay, so what I try to do is I try to uh, th think through how we could think about uh, the holder of territorial right, which isn't cultural nationalism and isn't a statist account. So I do, I, I have an account which has three distinct, well, it depends on how many, how many you count, but there's at least three moves. So the first move, the first step in explaining a right to over territory is that I want to say there's an individual moral right. So I have, so, okay, let me just back up a little bit. If you have a right over territory, it's a right to have jurisdiction, right? But to create, to have, to create jurisdictional authorities to create rules. And that whoever holds that right has to be a collective. Like individuals can exercise authority, uh, you know, self-determination over their persons, but jurisdiction is something that can only be done by groups. Right, because jurisdiction is the capacity to make laws and rules over a group. So you need a collective account. Okay, it's one of those group rights that only a collective can hold. Either a collective conceived like an institution, like a state, or a collective like a cultural nation. If you could imagine that as a sufficiently cohesive entity, so you need a. So it has to be a collect. It has. It is a group right. It's no other. You, no other way to think about jurisdiction. It's one of those rights that can only be held by a group. So I have to have an account of a group. But before I have an account of a group, I have an account of what rights individuals might have, place-related rights that individuals might have. Because I don't think, because I think there's two, two, two elements. So the first idea is that there's an individual moral right of residency. And I want to describe this as some kind of liberty right which attaches to individuals to reside in a territory which is also a right of non-dispossession. And then what, and what I want to say is that um, I connect this individual residency right with a collective right of occupancy. So, um, so I have to build self-determination right, but I want to do this in a way in which it builds on individual <coughs> residency rights. Not straightforwardly, but I want to say that individuals have to be legitimately resident on the land for the group to be said to occupy the land. And then the group is the group that has to be defined in a certain way to have, to have rights of jurisdiction. That's the structure of the argument. Okay? So you have different elements. You first have to have individuals in the right relationship to land and individuals in a relation to a group. And the group has to be the right kind of group to exercise jurisdiction. That's the three components. Okay, so the first probably maybe the easiest part. You have to keep track of the time. I oh, am? Yeah? Good. And you can just tell I'll, me. I'll give you a 10 minute warning. Good. 10 so, minute warning. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the first question is why might we think that individuals, and this is actually an important move here, is why do we think that individuals who live on a particular area of land have a moral entitlement to live there? And I think there's a couple of different arguments. So you might think that there's a basic right to live in a place free from expulsion. I think that's right. And then some of that are, so, so you can just forget what I said. I'm just going to try to build the argument here. So why might you think that we have a basic right to live in a place and not be expelled from it? And I think one part of the argument is that you have to, we're physical beings, we take up space, you have to reside somewhere. But, I, but what I want to say is a kind of stronger version of that right, which is the right to reside in the place you currently live in, assuming you have not displaced another person who had residency rights. So that, and, 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 and why might we think that the particular place that people live in is important to them? And I think there's two, two kinds of arguments. And one kind of argument is that in the course of your life, you have relationships and attachments to various people, and they require a location. 
So if you, so in the course of people's lives, we have, if we are to have control over our lives, we have to have stability in our background conditions that we, in which we exercise, um, in which we, we make a kind of path in our life and have relationships with people and that we shouldn't be expelled or forced to leave that place unless there's a compelling reason, right? And so I want to say that residency rights matter for all people. So it's not like a liberal autonomy argument. In fact, I think that whether people are autonomous or not autonomous in a liberal sense, it doesn't matter. All people should have some kind of security in their place, right? Not to be expelled, right? And this is actually pretty standard. But I also want to say that it's not just that you have attachments to people in a particular place, because that suggests that if you expel a whole group of people from a place, that somehow that's okay but we know that's not. We know that there's all kinds of evidence of people, like I mean, the Labrador Inuit, who have been expelled as a group from a place and who still felt that dislocated by this expulsion, even though they were all expelled together. So, so what I want to say is that, that sometimes the place that people live in is also integral to their aims and projects and their way of life, too. That there are some projects or some aims that can only be pursued in a particular location with either a particular institutional structure or a particular kind of geography. And, I mean, that's easy to see in the case of, like, a traditional group. But I, I want to make the argument that for all... The, so, okay, so in the case of the Labrador Inuit, the problem was that they hunted caribou and then they were dislocated because they couldn't pursue their way of life. But I, I also think that even people that aren't, that have a less symbiotic relationship with land, right? Like, so you think of rice farmers, they might re rely on certain kinds of rain, patterns of rainfall. And even people in urban settings, although require a kind of institutional structure, that's located somewhere to pursue their life. I mean, it would be a different, it might be larger or a different kind of place that they would need. Um, but what I want to say is we have reason to think that there's something also, that we have an attachment not only to each other but to place. And there's sometimes things about the place that make expulsion from the place a wrong. So that's, so that actually, that's, so what I'm trying to suggest here is that we, we should have, we, that there are place-related rights. So not just rights that are related to the state, but rights that are place-related. So I want to give individuals some rights. Rights not to be expelled, rights to like, basically kinds of liberty rights. And actually, it turns out to be rights of return. If, so, there's just, so there's some rights you hold that are place-related that, that are held by individuals regardless of whether they're in a group. So, but then I want to say... But actually, individuals are, off, are sometimes in groups. And the groups have to, are the ones that have to hold jurisdictional rights, rights to create rules and laws and to govern their relations together. So I need an account. If I'm going to do this, um, or anybody's going to do it, you need an account of a group. You have to have an account of a collective agent. The easiest kind of collective agent is something like a state, where there's an institutional structure and a decision-making structure. But I've already given reasons why I don't think we want to have a state as the main. So what I looked at was I looked at literature on collective agency, which is largely in philosophy. But, um, and think of the, and I argue that a people, you can have a group that meets the conditions of a collective agent. And I want to say that the right kind of collective agent to hold territorial rights, because it has to link the territorial rights with the group, is a group that meets three conditions. So they have to share a conception of themselves as a group where they subjectively co-identify with, they subjectively identify with co-members in terms of being engaged or desiring to be engaged in a common political project and they're mobilized in actions oriented to that goal. I want to say that they have to have a capacity to establish and maintain political institutions through which they can exercise self-determination because you can't give people, there's no point giving a group territorial rights if they don't have a capacity to exercise it. And the third thing is that they have to have a history of political cooperation together that is forged through objective and historically rooted bonds of solidarity. And I argue for these three conditions saying that they're all relevant to the kind of right that I'm trying to confer on them. That is a right to exercise jurisdiction and create rules that, co that, that, that have a coordinating and self-determination function. Um, and it's a non-cultural account because all those conditions 
all three of those conditions are political conditions. They aspire to political, to political aspirations, they have a political capacity, and the relationships are involved in a history of political cooperation together. Um, so, I don't know to what extent I want to talk about, all, if I need to talk more about those three conditions, but... And so the first, but I'll just say the first condition is that the group has to be able to make decisions and act on the basis of themselves in order to be a collective agent. So it's, it's not really, so the idea here is that um, the people have to ha be united by aspirations to engage, to have, um, to, to have for wide-ranging powers of jurisdictional authority. And then I talk about capacity. That actually limits certain kinds of groups and... Um, the third thing is, and and then the question is, this is maybe before I get to right to the end, because mm -hmm. I, I know I'm you're, under you're, a clock you're, here. You're, you're good, you're good. So that's, those are the three conditions that I want, that I think ought to be, should be met. And, and the account that I'm giving is an account, so we, I not only just try to describe the people as, in, in this way, as collective agents, but I... I'm trying to say, I'm, I'm, what I'm giving is a kind of relationship account, right, where I'm imagining that there is a significant good in these relationships that people have established. So um, I distinguish here. So one of the crucial moves, this is a little, this is a teeny bit of an aside, but I'm trying to think, I, what I think I need to do, not only describe collective agents, but I have to describe what the moral value would be in giving these people territorial rights, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, if it's going to be a normative argument, I can't just say, oh, well, these count as collective agents under the right kind of group because they could exercise it. I need to describe some kind of moral value that's attached to it, right? So the move here... It, so that's like a, the third part of the condition, right? Like, so I want to describe them in the right kind of relationship to land. Then I want to describe them as the right kind of collective agent. And now I've got to describe the moral value. So once I have all three in place, then I can just tell you why that's a good, a good, a better account. And the moral value, I say, is a, a value that I, I, is a kind of relationship account of good. So you can think of relationships as, care, as having goods. And that really there's two different kinds of relationship goods. There's relationship independent goods and relationship dependent goods. And it depends on how they function in the relationship. So if you think about relationship independent interests, this is a, a distinction that I use. The relationship independent interests are interests that a person has which require some kind of relationship to meet it, but does not require that that relationship is with a particular set of persons or persons. That's a relationship independent interest. So children have a relationship independent interest in being fed and cared for. It's an interest they have, and they need a relationship to meet it because they're children, they're babies or whatever, they can't do it on themselves. But it doesn't, but you can imagine that it doesn't matter, that that interest could be met by an orphanage or a grandma. It doesn't matter, it's not particular who meets that interest. And that's how we think about the state. We think about the state as performing certain kinds of, providing certain kinds of interests. So a child's interest in food and shelter and clothing is normally met by parents, but it could be met by some other party. But you might think that children also have relationship dependent interests, where it really matters that the, that, the, that, the, that, that, that the relationship is with a particular person or set of persons, right? And you can think about, like, reading children's stories, right, before they go to bed. I mean, you could just provide, you could think of it in a relationship-independent way, where you could provide, like, a, a tape recorder or something, or some, and that they could get the story read to them, right? And that's, and that, that's a relationship-independent interest in, in improving their literacy. But you might think that there's a relationship-dependent good here, too, which is that they're in a relationship with somebody close to them who snuggles with them in bed and reads them the story. And there's something particular about that relationship, which means that it's, not, it's a good that it has to be met by a particular person or set of persons. And you can think about all kinds of relationships having both elements. Sometimes you only have one, sometimes you don't. And so my mother, you know, my mother is, like, old. And it matters to her. So she needs more social activities. It matters to her. So she should, you know, it's important to give her social life. But it actually turns out that I just can't, like, get a proxy to go visit her. She wants to be visited by me, even though it would be sometimes convenient if I could get a proxy. 
that's the way relationships work sometimes, right? So um, really it actually matters who it's with. And so what I want to say is that in the case of political, about creating jurisdiction and rules, part of it is a relationship independent interest in, in creating rules of justice and, and goods that a state can provide. But some of it's relationship dependent interest where if there's a history or a relationship of people being mobilized together to create rules over their lives, they have an interest that it be with certain people and not with other people. And I want to say that that's a kind of important component that's missing in the statist account. And I don't think that that interest is necessarily rooted in culture, but it's interested in, a, in, a, in it with it, it's 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 connected to having um, group uh, in a in a it, it's it's a relationship account. So. Let me return now to the problem about failed states and unjust states and annexation, okay? So, um, because I think that that has to be something like the, account, the right kind of an account. Uh, not only because there's problems in those accounts that I gave, I don't know if you bought my uh, reason why I thought there were problems, but if you think about a number of cases, like uh, I think that my account, account gives us a better reason why we have, in, explains better the intuitions in the case of a failed state, a conquered state, and an unjust state. So if you go back to the case of a failed state, and I gave the example of Somalia, I don't know if that's just an unfair example, but it's usually used as an example of a failed state, and I don't, I don't, I'm not in IR, so I don't really know, but let's just assume. So um, if you're a failed state, then so I, so I look at a, the legitimate state theorists, and their argument is you, a state has territorial rights if it, it exercises justice over the domain. And so it looks like some other entity can better exercise justice than they should gain territorial rights. But my account s suggests that if there's a relationship amongst these people where they want to exercise territorial rights, they want to exercise jurisdiction, and if the state's a failed state, then maybe the right way to think about that isn't that they lose territorial rights, it's maybe that um, uh, maybe the idea here is that they should be facilit you should facilitate people in being able to create uh, the appropriate kind of jurisdictional authority, right? So, um, and then in the case of conquest, well, here it's a little bit difficult because a just state theorist, so one doesn't, isn't going to say, can, can always say, right, this Kantian account, can always say you can only exercise territorial rights if you have it justly. So, of course, if let's suppose you're an aggressor state and you come and conquer another state. It used to be actually you could gain rights of conquest. When you think about territory as property, that was really common. But if you're thinking about it in the Kantian terms, then conquest shouldn't give you territorial rights because conquest is unjust, right? So it looks like the, the state theorists can sort of deal with that. But then you have really difficult cases. And here, and the really difficult case, I think, from the statist account is Nazi Germany. Because there you have an unjust state as an aggressive state, right? And so it's not like the Allied powers went into Germany in an act of aggression. The Allied powers were the defense, were, I'm just imagining, so Nazi Germany was aggressive, right? They were the aggressive power, and they were unjust. I think we can all agree that they were egregiously unjust. So when the Allied powers defeated Germany, why was it then that we didn't just think we could gain territorial rights, right? Why is it that we thought we maybe occupied Germany sufficient for ger the German people to, re to, 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 to create forms of jurisdiction over their own lives and, create, and hopefully create a just state, right? And I don't think the statist account can deal with that because for them, they can say annexations, they can say conquest is wrong, but in cases where the unjust state is the aggressor state and is defeated, they have a problem. Because if territorial right is just held by just states then, and not held by the German people, then it was, it's a fair game to just go in and create justice there. Maybe you think it is, but I think that, that but 
but if you have an intuition that justice is a good way to organize your life, but that the people have some kind of meta-jurisdictional right, then I think you have to end up with a pre-political argument. And then you either have to choose a cultural one that has their German culture, or you have to say, no, it's because they have a political, they're mobilized politically to exercise political authority over their own lives. And those are, I think, your choices. So I think that it better accounts for intuition in cases of failed states and conquest, particularly in cases where annexation is of a state that's um, just. I think that kicks me right to the end, isn't it? You are, yeah. Yeah, that's at the end. So okay, so done? that's it. I'm done. Yeah, what, what, did I make it what, on time? Yep, you're perfect. What do you call the third, the, your approach? The first one was cultural. Oh, nationalism. yeah, so Legitimacy theories. that's What's a good question. One? So actually, what I, I don't do this here. I just describe it as a non-statist account. Oh, okay. But I argue that it has, that there's relation that there's the norms embedded in this account are norms similar to norms in democratic theory. So I call it a democratic theory. That all sounds better for one thing. Even though it's not straightforwardly democratic, it's an account that, that, re that relates the same kinds of moral principles that you find in democratic theory to this account of uh, territory. Okay. So it's a democratic account. Well, isn't that nice? Yeah, isn't that, and it turns better, out to yes, be nice as well, right? Very good. Okay. So. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Margaret. That's